This is FE Peer Review. The date is February the 7th, 2025. Flat Earthers, please learn to use your tools correctly. Thanks. Earlier today, Simon Dan put out a video reviewing a video by Anthony Bear. It's a good video from Simon Dan, and I'm putting a link to it in the description and in a pinned comment. There will be links to all the other things I mention here as well. So, first of all, kudos to Anthony Bear for actually getting up and doing some observations. He got a tripod and a transit, and he went out to the beach and he looked at things with it. That's great. Uh, now, it's a pity that his effort was in a way wasted because he he didn't use the equipment very well, and that's what I wanted to touch on in this video. I'm I'm not going to get into you know whether his observation proves the flat Earth or the globe Earth or whatever. I'm simply going to point out that you need to know how to use your equipment. You need to use it right. So this video is about two things. One, understanding and using your equipment. And two, margin of error, which is related to the first point. So he uses two pieces of equipment in this video. The first is this transit, and the second is Google Earth, which is, yes, indeed, a piece of equipment. And I am going to touch on Google Earth first. So in his video, he uses Google Earth to locate where he is and the distances to the various targets he's looking at. And that's a problem because Google Earth is a globe-based system and Anthony Bear is trying to make a case that the Earth is flat. So Anthony, you need to justify the use of Google Earth as a reliable tool when you're making a case that the Earth is flat. I'm gonna s now I made a claim about it being a globe-based system. So why am I? How am I going to support that claim? Well, quick, uh, a quick search on Google uh, brought up their developers page for people who work with Google Maps and Google Earth, and it has information about Google Earth, latitude and longitude values, which ref which reference a point in the world uniquely. Google used the World Geodetic System WGS eighty four standard. The WGS84 standard is a globe-based standard, and I'm going to support that claim by pointing towards the website of the National Geodetic Intelligence Agency, which is part of the U.S. Department of Defense. They maintain the database. The whole world, all the countries in the world, use the WGS84, and it's maintained by the U.S. Department of Defense. The World Geodetic System is a three-dimensional coordinate reference frame for establishing latitude, longitude, and heights for navigation, positioning, etc. WGS represents the best global geodetic reference system for the Earth available at this time. Note that it says global geodetic reference system, not flat geodetic reference system. The standard includes the definition of the coordinate systems, fundamental and derived constants, the ellipsoidal, normal Earth gravitational model, description of the associated world magnetic model. So it's all there. The uh, global positioning is based on it. The Earth gravitational model is based on it. The world magnetic model is based on it. It's a global setup. And if you wanted to get into that further, it's all here at the NGA military website. So. There you go. Google Earth is a globe-based system. So Anthony, next time you're doing one of these observations, you're going to need to justify your use of Google Earth. So that gets to the issue of understanding your tools. Now I'm going to touch on using your tools properly. Anthony's using a transit to do his observations. But when you use a transit, one of the things you're supposed to do is set it up level. And uh, at this point in this image, he's looking at a spot about five and a half miles from his station point. And we can see right away that his transit is not level side to side. We can see that because if we look at the horizon at the, at the ocean, we see at the far right that the water is considerably below this line. And then as we get to the center of the frame, the two lines meet. So. The, uh, the water line, the horizon line is not parallel 
to his transit. His transit is out of level side to side. It's tilted down on the left and up on the right. So Anthony, you need to level your transit. This pretty much makes your observations useless, especially the second one, which we'll look at briefly next. For Anthony's next observation, he set up two cardboard placards painted bright red. One of them was a mile away from him and the other was three miles away. This is what one of them looks like. He then set himself up with the transit at 60 inches above the sand, 5 feet. He had set his two targets up so that the top of the red panels were also 5 feet above the uh, waterline. He then proceeded to point his transit at the first target a mile away. And he made a kind of an odd decision here. He decided to point it straight at the target so that the crosshair would be at the top of the target without any consideration as to whether or not that was level. Now, as we're going to see in a moment, his t transit is not level side to side. And at this point, we don't know whether it's level in the forward direction either. And uh, he acknowledges that. He does not acknowledge the side to side problem. He acknowledges that he's pointing it at the top of the target. And he's aware of what that means. If the Earth is flat, his transit should be level because the top of the target and his location are the same height above the ground. But he also acknowledges that if the Earth is a globe, that target being a mile away should be eight inches lower. And if his target transit was level, his transit would be, the crosshairs would be eight inches above the target. So that said, so that said, he chose not to level his transit. He chose to point it straight at the target. Had he just simply worked with level, he could have saved himself and us some headaches because in panning along the beach with a transit that's possibly not level, he has to make adjustments for his second observation, which is annoying and unnecessary. He goes through time in his video showing those adjustments. Not needed. Should have just set it up level in the first place, side to side and front to back. So here we are looking at the target a mile away. We see that the crosshairs are approximately in line with the top of his target panel, which got blown around by the wind, so now we're seeing the back side of it. He's going to pan to the left, <clears throat> and because his transit's not level side to side, he's going to run into a problem. We see here on the left, to the left of the six mark, this red rectangle, that's the second target, that's three miles away. And at this point, it appears entirely above the horizontal crosshairs line. But you're going to see as it moves, as it continues to pan, the target's going to move to the crosshairs and drop down. So now we see that the top of the target is at the crosshair line rather than the bottom of the target. First time I saw that, I thought, oh, this guy is, is being tricky. He's trying to cheat here. He must have adjusted his transit when he realized things weren't showing up where he wanted them to. And then I thought, oh no, wait a minute, I shouldn't, I shouldn't jump to the conclusion he's lying or being deceptive. And then I thought, what else could be going on here? And then I realized, of course, it's the side to side out of level that his transit is, because his transit's set up out of level side to side that he's having this problem. Anything that's on the left side of the frame is going to move down as it goes over towards the right side of the frame because he didn't take the time to level his transit. That means we have no idea where anything is in terms of level. It's going up or down depending on whether it's in the middle or one side or the other side of the frame. So it's a useless observation because he doesn't understand the most basic thing about using a transit. So Anthony, my advice to you, learn to use a transit. And let me tell you, it's not difficult. You already own one, which is a big step uh, on the way there. I thought to myself, what can I tell Anthony that can be useful to him about learning to use his tools properly. And I thought, well, do a search on YouTube, how to level a transit. I did that right away up popped a wonderful little video, three minutes and 21 seconds long. Everything you need to know about setting up your equipment, right? Uh, and very simple and straightforward explanation. No time wasted. This guy here, he is, he has some kind of a license for doing the layout of buildings on the construction site. He works for a builder. So he's not a professional engineer. He's not a surveyor. 
um, but he has learned to use the same tools in order to do the layouts of buildings on a construction site. I gather that that um, certificate or license that he has is a simpler one to get than a surveying or engineering license. Uh, probably doesn't take as much time, probably doesn't require all the academic work, um, and yet it gives him the opportunity to become professional with his equipment and know how to use it right. So he shows how to use the equipment well. And it's really a very simple procedure. It takes him three minutes to explain it. It probably takes no more than a minute to actually do it. So Anthony, if you want to do a good job, in three minutes you can learn how to set up your equipment correctly. I strongly recommend that. Now, when I was doing land surveying as a student, an engineering student, this was before there was any GPS-based equipment. Everything was analog back then. And I did a year, two semesters of, of surveying classes. Uh, we learned some more, a little more detailed procedures that allow you to get a little better, more accurate results, which is great. But for this guy's purposes of laying out a building on a site, what he's doing works fine. So that means he's working in distances that are measured in, you know, 100 feet, 150 feet maybe 200 feet. He's not dealing with miles. And I thought, okay, well, that does bring up a question now, and we're moving into the second thing here, margin of error. How accurate is a setup like this over a distance of five and a half miles, like you were measuring in your video, Anthony, compared to just like laying out a building? So I thought, well, let's see what we can find out. And I found this company here, Johnson, they're called uh, Johnson Level and Tool Manufacturing. And what do you know, they actually make the equipment. So I figured who's better qualified to know how accurate their equipment is than the people who make it themselves. I went to their page on transits and levels. Let me back up one here. And they've got several models available. This one here in the middle is sort of the low end model. Retails for about $220 on Amazon. I think that's just this piece here, not the tripod and everything else. Uh, the one next to it over here is a higher end model, retails for about 320. I thought, well, what's the accuracy of the, of the cheaper one? You know, if a person wanted to do some serious good work and they could afford a couple of hundred dollars, what could they expect? And what we found under specifications was leveling accuracy right here, plus or minus three sixteenths of an inch over 100 feet. So I'm showing this to you, Anthony, because I want you to see how easy it is to get this kind of information and learn more about your tools. And then once you've done that, you need to factor that into your observation. So looking over a distance of 100 feet and carefully setting your tools up correctly, you can expect you may be off as much or you could think of it as as little as 3 sixteenths of an inch. But now extend that to five and a half miles. How far off would you be then using this tool? I'm not going to do the math right now. I don't feel like it, and it's not my problem. So, Anthony, a little piece of homework for you. Uh, I recommend you try doing the math and figuring out with this transit how far off you would be. Well, that pretty well sums it up. Anthony, if you happen to see this video, uh, just a quick recap. First of all, kudos to you for actually getting out there and doing some work. Now, I, I think it's a little bit unfortunate that I feel like you didn't get the value out of the effort you put in because you didn't really use your tools very well. I think perhaps you just simply didn't know what you needed to do. And I hope that don't consider this, you know, I'm not trying to insult you or anything, just it's worth your time to do a little research on understanding your tools and how to use them. And that was my main purpose in making this video. It's like, you know, you're going to you're going to put a nail into a board, you need to know that you need to use a hammer, not a screwdriver. If you are using a screwdriver, you need to say, okay, wait a minute, this nail here is not going to work. I better go find myself a screw. This is the importance of understanding your tools and how to use them. And alongside that comes the question of margin of error. What can we reasonably expect to achieve with the tools we have available to us? So those two points are really what this is all about. And I hope that uh, you'll take this on a positive, as positive criticism. All right, that's enough. Video's long enough. If you enjoyed this video, please do give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, well, sorry. 
I hope you didn't stay to the end. And I always welcome comments, so please do leave a comment. And if you haven't subscribed, I certainly hope you will. You have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.